verse 24 will gain our text and our understanding for the message out of verse 26. Verse 24, as we read together respectfully, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have your word, inerrant, infallible, preserved for us here today, that we might glean from, that we might uh, hear you speak to our hearts. Lord, I need you now as my father, as my friend, Lord, and I ask you to just speak to these individuals here, that you would give them that which they need, some seeking comfort, some seeking guidance, some seeking strength, and I pray that your work and your will would be manifest here today, and we give you the glory and honor in Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. When I was a kid, we used to gather in circles and contemplate how much we were worth. Maybe you can relate. You ever said, well, I'm worth this much or worth that much? Well, in, in reality, our soul is worth so much. We take out life insurance policies for certain amounts to ensure that uh, those that are left behind get a certain settlement, whether appropriate or not. But nonetheless, it seems to me that people pay for one's life or one's soul. You know, there are many in this world that think they're more precious or they're, they're more valuable than others to think uh, think that to me is nonsense, but none the, nonetheless, there are people that think they're more worthy or worth more than others. Maybe I can pose the title of the message in a question and to help relate what I'm trying to get across. If you were to place a price tag on your soul, what would be the numerical digit on that price tag? Right. Better yet, if you were going to sell your soul for a certain amount, what would be an acceptable bargain price that you would settle for? If we look at verse 26 again, Jesus kind of sums this up in such a way that he's serious. And we must pay rightful attention and rightful Serious, seriousness to what he's saying. In verse 26, let me read it again for you. What is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. On one side you have the, the incumbent world. You have every part of the world in this side. And on this side you have the soul. Jesus rightfully draws our attention to a comparison of one that is greater or the comparison of the known universe or the world and the person's soul. Briefly, what I believe the Lord is trying to share with us is that a human soul is far beyond the value of the world. Amen. In fact, if you look at the word world there, that's not necessarily speaking of the earth individually, but it's talking about the whole world as we know it. The whole universe as we know it. That word is cosmos. The, uh, the every bit of our solar system. Truly I think what Jesus is trying to tell us here this morning. Is that your soul is more worth more than all the universe. The suns, the moons, the stars, the planets. And I'd like to just share with you some reasons why Jesus is telling us your soul is worth more than the entire known universe. My mind cannot fathom the universe. They're regularly bringing a scientific documentation of things that are beyond what my eye can see, just as beyond what my mind can comprehend. I cannot comprehend a million galaxies away, although they tell me there's a million galaxies. I cannot comprehend 
uh, the, the far distance or the far reaching of the universe, which the Bible says is outstretched in the palm of God's hand. Amen. Amen. To think, Jesus says, what has a man profited if he gained everything in the hand of God and lost his own soul? Right. You know, in Malachi, in the latter part of the book, the Bible tells us that God looks at us like his precious jewel. Amen. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that he knows the, the numbers of the hair on our head. The Bible tells us that we are like the fingerprint of God. Over and over and over, God draws our attention to the fact that we are the pinnacle of his creation. Amen. And again, Jesus here relates everything as we know it to being less valuable than the soul. You know, when God looks out upon us, he sees our flesh. That's not what's more important than the known universe. In fact, the Bible describes the human being in somewhat the same way the Bible describes God having three distinct characteristics. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In man, we have the flesh or the carnal, we have the soul, and we have the spirit. The flesh is going to pass away. What I'm trying to relay and the importance in our, our portion of text here is, is Jesus is saying that your soul, that eternal part of you that will last forever is more important than everything that you possibly know. A soul is valuable because of what it is before God and God's purpose for a soul. We know the account of Genesis back when God created the earth and he looked out after he had created all the land beasts, all the water beasts, all the sea beasts. And three times the Bible records, he says, that is good. Three times. God said in Genesis, that is good. But in reality, God wasn't done. We know the full account of creation. In six days, God created. In the seventh, he rested. After he looked out and he saw things were good, he realized one thing was missing. God is love, and love has to have an object of its affection. I say I love. You can't just say I love. God is love, so therefore his love, his Precious love has to have a centerpiece or focus of that love to, to bestow his affections. And when God looked out upon the vast earth and the universe and he saw not a thing to bestow his affection, he said, let us make man in our image after Amen. our likeness. Amen. And the scripture says, in the image of God created him, male and female created he them. This is the greatest display of God's workmanship. Mankind and the eternal soul of man is the greatest display or manifestation of God's workmanship. Talk about the intimate touch of God in our life. To think that out of the ground God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, out of the, the particles that set above the ground, God in his power and might reached down and took that and formed Adam. And into his nostrils he breathed the breath of life, making man a living soul. Amen. A conscious living soul. And that's very, very important because this living soul that Adam has, that you and I have, has the ability to receive God's love, to return God's love, to respond to God's love, to think the thoughts of God, to live the life of God, to live with God, to walk with God, to talk with God. We've got a piece of God in us, our eternal, everlasting soul. The purpose of God for creating man with a living soul wasn't to have him be like himself, although that is what the Bible tells us. God created us in his image after his likeness. But no, the purpose for God creating man with a living soul is so he would have a pinnacle of his creation that he adored, that he loved, that he could bestow all his love and upon. Amen. 
You know, when God created an Adam, he, he specifically gave Adam the command to reign and rule on the, on the earth. He, told, he gave Adam the dominion of all the creatures, and he gave Adam the ability and the ownership or the responsibility to rule the entire earth. With the intent one day to look forward to eternity, to rule and reign with Christ. In the face of this fact, many will turn their backs on such a destiny to follow vanity. Right. You see, what Jesus was doing, he was saying, there's somewhat, you can classify them in, in any category as two people. But Jesus was saying, really, there's two types of people. There's those people that are going to follow the world and the riches of the world, not considering their soul. But Jesus said, don't be like that man. Amen. Don't be like that woman. Don't be like that young person or kid and lose, lose a glimpse of reality when Jesus said our soul, that eternal being within us is more important than anything we know. But still, so many people, they turn their back on such a wonderful destiny. These people are deceived from the specific purpose of God. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't say, whoops, accident, things, things are not like that with God. Although, Amen. many times it's like that with me. Whoops. God doesn't make mistakes. In each individual person, He specifically speaks puts a living soul in that person with a designed purpose to serve and to glorify God with their life. Amen. That's right. Amen. Yet many people are deceived and defeated in their lives and they miss out on this, uh, this life-long desire of God that they might be with God, that they might follow God, that they might share in, in fellowship with God. They're deceived, they're defeated, And they're destined for a life separated from God for eternity. You know, many people miss the infinite, loving, glorious purpose of God in their lives. They just simply miss it. That's right. Maybe because they're not looking for it, they're not listening for it, they're not in the right place at the right time, so to speak, and, and all that's true plus more. But when they miss the loving, glorious purpose of God, they miss something so much more. They forfeited the opportunity to share the glory with Christ for all of eternity. That's why Jesus said, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, the whole universe as we know it, and lose his own soul? Jesus placed a very high value upon the soul. And that's because the soul lives forever. Amen. The soul Amen. will live forever. Amen. I cannot say it and stress it enough. Your soul is going to live forever. Right. It's a biblical fact. Your soul will live forever. Have you ever tried to... You know, individuals can master a skill. Mechanics can master and understand a car... Or, or individuals can master and understand, or master and understand a trade like barbers or mechanics or engineers or electricians. They do it so long, and they they've been through all the gamut of scenarios where they come to a place where there's really nothing new that faces them. They understand it. They they they've with their mind mastered the knowledge of a specific thing. Have you ever tried to comfort? comprehend eternity even even if I tried I mean I, I tried and I tried and and many of us will try but we'll come to the same conclusion that there's our minds are finite and unable to grasp the importance of eternity That's right my mind staggers it just it, it doesn't comprehend eternity oh the truth of of this great thought is that our souls will live forever. You see, when, when Jesus compared the whole world to the soul, really what he was saying is temporal 
and everlasting. Amen. The whole right. world in this universe will one day not be. That's right. That's right. There was a time when I was not. There was a time when God created the world and you were not. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. You were not. Abraham was called of God in the back part of the wilderness. You were not. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You were not. George Washington crossed the Delaware with his men, his barefooted men at that, leaving footprints of blood through the snow to capture a freedom that we are fighting for today, but still then, you were not. That's right. Please listen to me, my friends. There was a time that we were not in existence. But now that we are, there will never be a time that we won't, we won't be anymore. There will never be a time that we will not be living somewhere. When the earth and all that we know, as Jesus said, the, the cosmos, when the cosmos is no more, you will still be living somewhere. That's right. When the sun, moon, and stars pass away into nothingness, our souls will be living somewhere. When everything as we know it is no more, the reality is our souls will be living somewhere. Our souls are going to go on living and living and living. Think about the soul of the young rich man. You know the story, the, the young rich ruler that ran up to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus simply said, Go sell all that you have and come and follow me. Think about the... the Rich man in Lazarus. Lazarus was at his at, at the rich man's gate begging bread, and the Bible tells us that the dogs even licked the sores. And the rich man went to hell. Their souls, even today, are living. Over two thousand years pass and gone. Their souls are living. Two thousand more years. 2,000 more years, 6,000 years from now, their souls are going to be living forever. Right. In fact, the Bible tells us that the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes in torment and begged for just one morsel, one drop from Abraham's hand to touch his lip to give him one moment of comfort. It's an unspeakable tragedy to be in this day and age, especially in America to be without Christ. Amen. It's an absolute tragedy. We've got churches on every corner, and we've got Bibles, and we've got TV broadcasts and radio broadcasts, and it's just saturated this land. So that's why I say it's an unspeakable tragedy to be without Christ as Lord in these days. Now we understand what Jesus was saying in the latter part of the verse when he said, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Let me draw your attention back to the, the first part of this sermon. When you put a price on that price tag of your soul. What would you give to have your soul? What would you give to buy back your soul after it's lost in eternity Forever in hell. You know, when I read this, look with me in verse 26. When I originally read this, I have to admit, I made a, a, a small mistake. Because I had gone by so many times, before. I had gone by what I was told so many times before, instead of reading it simply for myself. I made a simple error. I, I read this with the idea that uh, this soul or this owner of the soul is in the marketplace. And on one hand you have God Almighty and on the other hand you have the deceiver, the devil. And they're both weighing in and bidding and pricing and, and throwing offers back and forth for the soul. In such a way that it kind of pits uh, Jesus and the devil together to purchase this individual soul. But look at it with me. That's not what it's saying it's all, at all. It's not saying, what will you take? Look at it. It says, what shall a man give? The man's already lost his soul. The man no longer has possession of his soul. No longer is he in control of his soul's eternal destiny. Or the alternative is the man's already lost his soul in a place of torment we know as a lake of fire or hell. 
What would you give in exchange for your soul after it's lost forever? You know, we read this portion of Scripture and we kind of see a soul on, on a pendulum, so to speak. And, and, and it's either way in this way towards Satan or it's way in that way towards Christ. And there's no middle ground with a person's soul. It's either all the way with Christ or it's all the way with the devil. There's no medium ground with a person's soul. That's why it doesn't say what shall a man take as if to imply that there's offers made and, and that there's a, a, a way to go. No, it's either you're on one side, your soul is either in the, in the grasp of Satan pulling you down to eternal destruction or your soul is in the ever-loving, merciful, and gracious hands of God leading you to the promised land. There's no middle ground, my friend. Think about the young rich ruler that I, I shared with you a second ago. He came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know the story. And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and come follow me. What the man do? He was. He went away sorrowful. Think after 2,000 years of time now, he might have gone back and said, Jesus, I'll fall at your feet and follow you for a lifetime. You think just for a glimpse, a moment he would, he would give to, to just take advantage of the opportunity that was before him? Just to go back and, and kneel at the feet of Jesus. You know, sometimes we look at the cost instead of the gain. And let's say I had an envelope, a tithe envelope. And I beckoned with you and bartered with you, trying to uh, get one of you individuals to buy this envelope for $100. $100. You just and, and finally some individual comes up and says, here, I'll, I'll play along with your game, so to speak, or, or your illustration, and, and buys the envelope for $100. And as the individual is walking back to their seat, I say, wait a second, open that envelope. Show everybody what's in it. And as the individual opened the envelope, they would have seen, as all of us would have seen, that there was $10,000 in that envelope. Folks, we get so caught up in how much it's going to cost us. That's right. That's right. When nothing, nothing as we know it is in comparison to heaven and glory. That's what Jesus is saying. What is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Simply put, God is asking for this, this $100 body to give us a million dollar body in heaven. Our life is but a vapor. It's just a short time. And we get so caught up in living our life and living our way and seeking our desires and running after money and running after fame and popularity and success. And, and, and we forget what's really important. Amen. And what's really important is securing with certainty your home in heaven. If I might make a, a plea or a beckon to the wandering soul here today, don't pass up the chance to secure your home in heaven. If you pass up heaven and your once in your eternal destiny is in hell, I promise you, you would give a thousand earths to come and hear a gospel preach a gospel preacher preach a message again. You would give all your resources to hear one simple song sung about Jesus. You would give a lifetime, so to speak, of all that you had to have that opportunity back. Right. That's right. To simply take that soul. Look, the reality is the soul that is yours is yours. And what you do with it, who you sell it to, so to speak, is up to you. But you know, the truth isn't to think about what you would do after it's too late. What you would do after you lost your soul in eternity. But what will you do about it now? Amen. The Bible is clear today. Right now is the time of salvation. Right now is an opportunity in which... The, the God of all creation has 
specifically put this church here and put this mouthpiece to herald the good news of Jesus Christ. I wonder what Satan's offered you for your soul. Think about it for a minute. What kind of deal would you make for your soul? What kind of deal with the devil would be good enough? Right, right. You want to hear something just... <coughs> I know I'm a young preacher, and, and I thank the Lord for that, and I've got a lot to learn. But for whatever reason, I typed my sermon point in Google, what will Satan offer you for your soul? It's absolutely wicked. Absolutely wicked in the fact that there are people that will write up contracts. There are satanic lawyers that will uh, allow you to hire them to write specific contracts that are uh, registered with the, the satanic church in, with you, in which you rightfully sold your soul to the devil. Now based on the words of Jesus Christ, are we to think that there's any price, any amount of money, any... Anything in this universe that would be worth our soul? No, what usually happens is the soul sells out to something minuscule, less important. And they sell out for a fun time of pleasure and enjoyment. And the Bible does say that there is pleasure in sin. Absolutely. Comma, for a season. One day that pleasure will run out. One day that joy and that flesh-seeking uh, embodiment will run out. And at that day, you will find that you've been bit like a serpent. And you will miss out on the greatest thing of all creation, of all time, the entire universe, and that's heaven. You'll never, ever, ever find a soul that has followed the lies and the deceptiveness of Satan that in turn looks back and says, Oh, that was a good ride. That was enjoyable. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Hey, you should do that. No, 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 my friend. Never will you find a person that is sold out to the devil and looks back and says, That was enjoyable. Right. You won't find it. It's, it's, it, it don't go together. Why can't we see, why can't we just look out into the world and see all the hurting and all the pain and all the anguish that simple word sin has caused and learn from our observation. When I do bad, I guarantee you bad is on its way. I've te I'm teaching my kids that right now. If you want good, you do good. If you do bad, daddy's coming. <laughs> But that's the reality. And I tell my children too. And you ask my wife. And, and uh, my, my daughter's asked me this. She says, well, who's your daddy? I say, Jesus. Because just the same way my daughter is responsible or my son is responsible to obey and follow me and the Lord, I'm just equally responsible to follow my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've gone to my child and said, Jesus gave me a spanking. And I've expressed to her what I did wrong, or what I told, tell my son what I did wrong, and Jesus had to punish me. Sometimes they don't understand, but still, there's that accountability that we're all responsible for. And we need to learn from observation and not experience. Right. You know, many men and women have gone before us each, and they look at our life and they try to lovingly guide us and encourage us according to the direction that they see us going. Why? Because they've been there. They know firsthand. Right. Yeah. Yes, God offers us His unconditional love. He offers us the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from our sin. He offers us the release of of the chains of bondage that have our soul locked up with a padlock that is indestructible and only Jesus has the key. God offers for our soul to set it free. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Right. And also Jesus said uh, he who I've set free is free indeed. Amen. Right. Just a simple illustration and we'll close up. There was a man at the state fair 
I didn't go this past year, but when I went a few years later or a few years prior, there was this man and he was doing a presentation and he was uh, real gung-ho about his super oxidized cleaner and he, he emphatically proclaimed it as the cleaning solution, the best cleaning solution of all the earth. And his presentation was a demonstration of how that cleaning solution was going to clean anything rightfully taking its place as the best cleaning solution of the earth. To prove his case, he had one handkerchief, a white brand new handkerchief right out of the package, and two bowls. In one bowl, it was filled with ink, in which he said was the hardest thing to get out of clothes. And in the other bowl, 